My presentation is about the um, uh, Japanese philosopher Hirobatsu Wataru. Hiromatsu Wataru, uh, a Marxist philosopher in late 20th century Japan, introduced a pair of concepts, this pair of concepts, valid and prevalent. Uh, of course, this is uh, my translation of his uh, Japanese terms. I'll explain about it later. Uh, those uh, pair of concepts um, are a key juncture, juncture uh, of his philosophical thought. Hirobatsu's argument on valid values and prevalent values serves as a crucial link connecting his philosophical theory to social practice, the dimension of social practice, especially practice aiming at revolutionary social change. I first outline Hiromatsu's argument and then critically examine that argument, uh, specifically his point that the value, valid values are justified by their becoming prevalent. First, uh, an outline. The basic motif of Hiromatsu's philosophy is a critique of the modern worldview which he characterizes as ontologically substantialist and epistemologically bound by the subject-object schema. He seeks to replace this modern worldview with a new philosophical orientation marked by the primacy of relation and what he calls the intersubjective four-fold structure. This four-fold structure uh, I'm not going, to, going into uh, in this uh, uh, talk. In this general philosophical setting, he develops a thoroughly relational account of meanings and values, including truth, justice, and so on. He criticizes the reifying notion that meanings and values exist independently uh, in themselves, and he argues that they, those meanings and so on, exist only as relational intersubjective moments of phenomena. Since intersubjectivity develops and changes historically and socially, it follows that meanings and values are historically and socially relative. What implications does it have to take this kind of relativist position? In an early work, Hiromatsu argues as follows. If we recognize the values that are actually intersubjectively shared among people, and if we accept them as our own norms, then we will have a consistent system with no discrepancy between facts and norms. This is the case if someone says, for example, although uh, this is not an example, example given by Hiromatsu himself, that the, the emperor system in Japan should be maintained because this system is actually supported by many people. Hiromatsu rejects this kind of approach, however, saying that it is nothing other than a conservative affirmation of the status quo. Yet, he continues, quote, if we seek to find our norms elsewhere, we could run the risk of a metaphysical dogmatism, unquote. Hiromasu asks, asks himself, how can this dilemma be resolved? In an effort to overcome this dilemma, Hiromasu later developed his ideas of what he calls valid and prevalent, mainly in these works um, um, indicated here. Let's start with his argument on valid truth and prevalent truth. He introduces a quasi-Kantian distinction. Quote, valid, datoteki, gültig in German. Valid truth is truth asserted as a matter of right, or a quid juris or juris. While prevalent, Tsuyoteki, gelten, truth, 
is truth commonly accepted as a matter of fact, or with facti. In this way, valid truth is defined from the point of view of the person involved, while prevalent, value, uh, prevalent truth is defined from a third par party point of view. For example, in 17th century Europe, when the geocentric view of the universe was still prevalent, Galileo and others advocated the heliocentric view as a valid truth. Valid truth is usually considered as the agreement between the judgment and the objective fact. Hiromatsu rejects, however, this conventional notion of truth as correspondence or adequate adequation based on the subject-object schema and instead presents a view of truth as inter intersubjective validity. According to Hiromatsu, quote, a valid truth is justified depending on the factual question of whether it actually has an intersubjective conformity. This is not to say, however, that valid truth is simply reduced to prevalent truth. Rather, while retaining the distinction of valid and prevalent, Hiromatsu tries to relate the two as follows. Sometimes a truth asserted by a minority or an individual through dialogical interaction between people becomes accepted by others and dynamically leads to the formation of an intersubjective system of truth. In this way, Hiromatsu claims, quote, a valid truth must show itself as a truth capable of being prevalent and must become a prevalent truth. Hiromatsu's argument so far on valid and prevalent truth is basically extended to all kinds of values. So for Hiromatsu, truth is just uh, one kind of value. Uh, uh, value. So uh, that means the validity of practical values is also their intersubjective validity and can only be judged depending on whether uh, quote, whether intersubjective, intersubjective conformity or congruity is actually established as a matter of fact. Through the end of the second volume of being and meaning uh, his uh, uh, most important uh, and major uh, uh, book, he uh, remarks the following. Uh, and you, you have the, the quotation here. Insofar as we cannot accept a prevalent value, we contest the prevalent value and instead assert a valid value. The assertion of the valid value, since it is for the time being devoid of intersubjective universality, is treated as a minority or heretical view by those supporting the prevalent value. However, we strive practically to make the value we are certain into an intersubjective, intersubjectively uniform, that is, a prevalent value. Furthermore, this effort does not limit itself, itself to a merely theoretical struggle, but rather aims at a revolutionary change of the actual historical and historic uh, social system. In this way, starting from within, Yet moving beyond the framework of his philosophical theory, he argues for making valid values prevalent and seeks to connect this point to the practical task of social changes. But in, in, in this context, he doesn't go into a concrete um, a political um, uh, strategies or tactics uh, um, <clears throat> for um, the social revolution. He, he, he does uh, discuss uh, those kinds of issues in, in other um, works, more practically oriented works. Uh, for Marxist philosopher Hiromatsu, his argument on valid and uh, prevalent thus co constitutes a crucial link 
connecting, connecting his philosophical theory to the dimension of social and of social revolutionary practice. However, there remains the question of whether this argument uh, is okay, holds good. In what follows, I will critically examine his, this argument uh, with a focus on his point, central point, that valid values are justified, they are becoming prevalent. So, uh, a critical analysis. Uh, let me start by noting that when Hiromatsu discusses valid and prevalent values, two different, different conceptual dimensions tacitly overlap without being clearly analyzed. First, one of the dimensions concerns the quantity or number of those who assert or support values. In this dimension, the distinction between valued and uh, prevalent, uh, prevalent corresponds to the difference between individuality or particularity on the one, on the one hand and generality on the other. That is, the becoming prevalent of valid values means, in this dimension, that values initially advocated by an individual or small minority in due course become accepted by a wide range of people. Here there arises this question. Uh, so, uh, on the, uh, the reverse side of the sheet. Um, <clears throat> uh, are all values realized by their being shared by a majority? Are there no values that are characterized by their resistance to becoming intersubjectively uniform? In my view, the concept of singularity and related meanings and values involve the paradox that if they are realized at as intersubjectively shared values, they may precisely thereby be invalidated. In other words, even if the value of singularity is justified by its becoming prevalent, this justification at the same time undermines the value in question. Second, Hiromatsu's account of value, uh, valid and prevalent values contains another conceptual dimension the dimension of the standpoint from which to conceive value. For the valid value to exist, the subject, P, that conceives it, must be involved in the value judgment itself. Insofar as the subject concerns the question of right of the value, it must practically engage with the value itself. In contrast, the prevalent value <coughs> concerned with the question of fact, is conceived solely only by a subject P prime that cognitively reflects on the value judgment. This reflective subject P prime does not practically participate in the ju value judgment itself, but is only aware of the fact that the value is asserted by uh, a certain subject or uh, subjects. The prevalent value is a value thus cognitively objectified, that is, made a mere object of knowledge. This being the case, the becoming prevalent of the valid value involves not only its becoming intersubjectively uniform, as seen above, but also a change in the standpoint from which to conceive the value, and thereby a transformation of the value into a value-free cognitive object. Value free in quotation marks. Uh, this puts in question Hiromatsu's point that the valued value is justified by and only by becoming prevalent. If the concept of justification presupposes the existence or subsistence of that which is justified, the valued value cannot be justified by its becoming prevalent. Or, if justification can contain a moment that undermines what is justified, we should say the following. Even if the valid value may be justified by its becoming prevalent, 
This state of affairs disin disintegrates itself by the valid value being no longer itself. Thus far, we have investigated Hiromatsu's argument on valid value and a prevalent value from an, an intra uh, theoretical point of view, uh, <clears throat> internal to, uh, uh, theory. Let us further examine what practical meaning or implications this argument has as a point of contact with social practice. As we have seen, Hiromatsu rejects the conservative affirmation of the status quo and seems to have successfully broken with such conservative conformism by introducing the distinction between valid and problem. Yet, when he seeks, to justific seeks the justification of valid values in their becoming problem, does not this imply another kind of conformism? That is my question. Relevant here is the question of whether and how we know about prevalent values in future. As is well known, traditionally determinism and indeterminism have been opposed to each other um, as follows. According to determinism, the future state of things is unambiguously predetermined and cannot, cannot be freely changed while indeterminism maintains that the future state is indeterminate and depends on our voluntary action. Hiromatsu's approach is neither of the two. He criticizes and delimits both determinism and indeterminism and thereby uh, proposes a probabilistic uh, account. The future state may be determined but not unambiguously, but uh, with a latitude of uncertainty so as to allow of relative freedom. If freedom and determination are thus made compatible to a certain degree, making valid values uh, prevalent uh, <clears throat> cannot be a simple, simply willful act, but is uh, partially mediated by a predictive knowledge of future prevalent values. This being the case, there seems to be a kind of circular relation between valued values in the present and their becoming prevalent in the future. That is, if a certain value is, is predicted with a high probability to become prevalent in the future, this prediction prompts people to support the value as valid and strive to make it prevalent, and this effort in turn makes it still more probable, probable that the value in question will become a uh, problem. Uh, for example, if the abolition of capitalist society is expected to be widely supported in future, this expectation prompts people to advocate abolition capitalism, and this makes it still more probable that the abolition of capitalism will be widely supported. This temporalized circular stru structure may be considered a conformism in which the relation to the future, instead of to the present, the relation to the future plays a, an important role. While Hiromatsu rejects the conservatism of affirming the status quo, which is a conformism centered on the present, his valid prevalent argument leads to another form of com conformism a future-oriented conformism. We are now faced with the question, can or should revolutionary social changes be conceived and carried out along the lines of this future-oriented conformism? In other words, does the task of a social change consist in replacing the existing intersubjective conformity with another intersubjective conformity? Or, does it also, or more importantly, lie in resisting and undoing the very structure of intersubjective conformity and seeking a relation to the other that goes beyond the uniform we? If la the latter is the case, I, and uh, this is 
my position, I, I, I think that I support the latter. Um, not only the conservative affirmation of the status quo, but future-oriented conformism should also be questioned and overcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so, uh, 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 to the first question, um, so I would say, um, so this is a, 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 a relative freedom uh, is a, uh, that uh, that term appears in uh, my explanation of uh, uh, um, Hiromatsu's uh, uh, view. Um, um, in, well, um, uh, uh, you know, much as view of the future state of uh, things and future uh, uh, future uh, problem values, uh, uh, its position is different both uh, from uh, determinism and indeterminism. So, um, determinism uh, denies uh, our real freedom. Uh, <clears throat> Hiromatsu uh, admits of uh, some degree of freedom, and he, uh, I don't think he uh, specifies uh, what kinds of freedom. Yes, because relative, what's the meaning then of relative? Not, not absolute, yeah. relative. Yeah, that's nothing more. Yes. Nothing, 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 nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and about uh, the second yeah. uh, question, so, um, the uniform we. So your, your question was... Uh, because, for example, uh, nowadays we listen to many uh, mm. political uh, yeah, yeah, discourses yeah. and yeah, propaganda, yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, they say common good. Yeah. Common good is equal to a we. Or, uh, mm. Mm. So my question is that, uh, uh, in this case, uh, do, you, do you agree with the fact that sometimes with this common good equal to we, uh, mm is uh, being used to fight, in fact, uh, mm. this uh, mm. uh, intersubjective mm. uh, conformity. Mm. Um, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the meaning of the common good uh, itself. So uh, I can't it's, say it's, much. It's, it's, you know, in, in some. Uh, political discussions, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, we share mm -hmm. or we, we, we mm -hmm. have so, in accordance with this uh, mm -hmm. common good as a mm -hmm. political uh, mm -hmm. telos. Yeah. yeah, so, so, so in, that, it, in that sense, uh, that term is used uh, in an international context, uh, as well in the national context. So, mm, um, I don't know exactly what, how, how, uh, how I, I, I can respond, but the, the uniform we is a term I, uh, I have chosen uh, to characterize uh, some implications of Hiromatsu's philosophy. 
So he, his position uh, seems to me to uh, be in the direction of enforcing, uh, um, reinforcing uh, the notion of the uniform we. And uh, that uh, I find uh, problematic and dangerous. Okay. Uh, when I, I was young, um, I was uh, somehow uh, partly not so much uh, uh, um, 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 in a uh, you know, leftist uh, movement, um, partly um, influenced by Hiromatsu. And uh, we often said, we often use the ter uh, term we. We fight together against the government policy. Now that we. So uh, we didn't question uh, the we so much. Yeah. And, uh, at that time. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs>